I'm going to start straight away by simply in introducing Dr. Rachel Davis. Um, her university career has taken her from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, to the University of Edinburgh, where she completed her doctorate in 2020. Um, she's now, among other things, working on Astle's Scottish Seals, which were published in the Antiquaries vo volume Vetusta Monumenta. And there's an online scholarly edition, facsimile and comments, being edited by Noah Herringman of the University of Missouri. And she is working on the uh, heraldic seals in, in Scotland. So um, it's with very great pleasure that um, I hand over to you, Rachel. Thank you, John. Just get my PowerPoint up. Okay. So before I begin, I would like to thank the School of History, Classics and Archaeology at the University of Edinburgh, who partly funded my PhD research on women's seals and charters in late medieval Scotland. I would also like to thank the Scottish Historical Review Trust, whose bursary has funded research for this paper. Some of the seals and ideas I'll be discussing here today also appear in a forthcoming article I have titled Material Evidence, Reapproaching Elite Women's Seals and Charters in Late Medieval Scotland, which is due to be published in volume 150 of the Proceedings of, of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland um, later this year in November. The seal of Isabella, Countess of Fife, features a tree from which two branches extend downward. Shields hang from these branches on either side of the tree. The Dexter right shield bears a lion rampant, the arms of Fife, her natal lineage. The sinister shield on the left bears a fest checky, the arms of Stuart, one of her marital families. The seal design differs from what we might expect of an elite woman's seal in the Middle Ages. For one, there is no female figure, a predominant feature of women's seals on the continent and in Britain in the 12th and 13th centuries. However, when considered alongside other elite women's seal designs from the 14th and 15th centuries in Scotland, the ways in which her identity was constructed bear similarities to other extant impressions belonging to elite women from the late medieval period. This paper aims to move discussion beyond what Brig Brigitte bedos rezac termed the semantics of the female image and show that female use of heraldry in their seals is a significant and rich vein of further research into the ontological meaning of sealing in medieval Britain. The paper is guided by two overarching questions. First, how do women's seals show evolution in heraldic convention and sealing praxis in Scotland in the 14th and 15th centuries? Second, was women's use of heraldry formulaic? Investigating these questions will show significant changes in women's seal design from the late 13th to mid 15th centuries. The evidence demonstrates women's participation in the emerging practice of marshalling arms to accommodate their complex and varied relationships to elite lineage and landed titles. I will argue that women's use of heraldry was by no means formulaic. Rather, the arrangement of arms within a seal communicated a woman's personal identity as a member of the aristocracy, in so much as we can say this was an indicator of the personal self. We might think of elite seals as an, in, in, as an extension of an individual's public facing self. Thus the iconography included, even if personal, was used to communicate links most advantageous to an individual's exercise of power and authority. This project sought out impressions and casts belonging to elite Scottish women from around 1296 to roughly 1460. Thus far, I have identified 54 seals. I began my research with the Scottish seal catalogues compiled by Henry Lang, William Ray MacDonald, and John Horne Stevenson and Marguerite Wood. 
I also consulted the catalog of British Museum material compiled by Walter de Grey Birch, listed here on the left. I used these catalogs as a starting point, and then I further consulted materials held in the following archives listed here on the right. It's worth noting that further repositories were consulted with negative results, including private collections identified through the National Records and Archives of Scotland, the Manuscript Commission reports, PIS, Scran, Canmore, and Treasure Trove Holdings of the National Museum of Scotland. It's also worth saying that Scottish sigillography, the seal cast produced by Lang, that for Scottish sigillography, excuse me, the seal cast produced by Lang in the 19th century and Stevenson and Wood in the early 20th century remain a vital link for historians in Scotland as impressions affixed to documents survive precariously. While the findings presented here today take in the heraldic devices of women's seals surveyed in impressions and casts, and in one instance, an illustration, I want to note that there are subtle differences in these types of source material. As this paper specifically is going to trace women's use of heraldry, I won't go further into methodological concerns here, but I have dealt with this more broadly in my work, and I'm happy to answer any questions relating to this after the paper. The title of Stevenson and Wood's 1940 volume conveys a sense of comprehensiveness, even an exhaustion of the archives to indicate the extent of Scottish seals, particularly when it comes to heraldic ones. However, recent work on the part of Adrian Ailes and David M. Bertie has demonstrated the possibility of, quote, new seals um, not included in Scottish seal catalogues. Birdie, in his work on Scottish bishop seals, has further observed issues of inaccuracy within the descriptions of seals in these catalogues. My work, as well, has indicated errors in description um, when compared to physical evidence. So far, I've identified six new seal impressions belonging to Scottish women from the 14th and 15th centuries, which were missed out in earlier cataloging efforts. These are included here on the left. I've also identified two casts not included in Scottish catalogs, but do appear in the catalog for British Museum material listed here on the right. I mentioned this to highlight the still untapped potential for further study into Scottish sealing and the seal catalogs and that the seal catalogs by no means represent the fullness of surviving material. I think it's worth noting the differences between current research interests and the past motivations of catalog compilers. While heraldic devices employed by women were noted by catalogers in the 19th and 20th centuries, they were not necessarily considered significant amongst, amongst Scottish seals. Illustrative and photographic plates more often featured examples of men's seals, particularly those belonging to royals, magnates, and important bishops, rather than the seals of women and those of the lower nobility, with even less attention paid to non-elite seals. I would argue that there's still much more to be gleaned from the meaning of seals using heraldic devices and how this iconography was employed by women to communicate political and personal links. If we begin with the seals on the left of Margaret Brinsason and David Gila Crawford, which survive attached to homage rolls to Edward I from the 1290s, we can see the shifts in heraldic and sealing convention by the mid 15th century with the seal of Mary Stuart, Countess of Angus and Lady of Logram on the right here. The comparison of these seals side by side highlights these changes in Scotland. First, we notice a change in shape with the 13th century seals using an oval shape. This shape of seal for women seems to have fallen out of fashion fairly early in the 14th century in Scotland, with women's seals using a round shape like the 1459 seal of Mary Stuart more often. We also notice a difference in iconography. The earlier seals use the female figure compared to the armorial seal of the 15th century. In addition, the heraldry has changed we see single, albeit uh, indistinct, 
shields in Margaret Brinsace and in David Gala Crawford's seals, whereas we see the marshaled arms of Mary Stuart on the right. The stark differences between the seal designs of the late 13th century and the mid 15th century show the evolution in sealing praxis and heraldic convention amongst Scottish women in the later Middle Ages. The rest of this paper will trace these evolutions. The 54 seals that make up this study are armorial in that they use a, a heraldic device in their visual field as well as other iconographic elements from older sealing conventions. Of these seals, only two feature heritable insignia not on a shield, meaning they use iconography that is associated with heraldry, but it's not within the visual field of a shield. I viewed these as seal casts taken from seals attached to charters dated before 1340. The remaining 52 of the seal impressions and casts incorporate one or more coats of arms to display women's connections to different elite lineages. Most commonly, women represented their lineage in their seals through the display of a single shield, although this was not as straightforward as it may appear. The number of single escutcheons found in the seal designs of elite Scottish women reflects the proliferation of marshaled arms during the later 14th century in Scotland, which allowed elites to express their complex relationships to lineage and power more succinctly. We might return then to the seal of Margaret Stewart from our previous slide to demonstrate this. The Countess's seal features a single shield, but in fact shows three lineages. The right side of the shield shows quartered arms with the lion rampant at the top representing Angus and a heart and chief three stars at the bottom representing Douglas, both of which were families she was related to by marriage. On the left side of the shield, we see a lion rampant within a double trezura, the royal arms of Scotland, which were her natal lineage. The use of heraldry by elite women in their seals has been interpreted as largely formulaic. When interpreting seals using the female figure, the woman has been described as a bodily link, a conduit between two lineages represented by the shields on either side of the body. Previous scholarship, particularly on English material, has suggested this followed a formula. Within this formula, the right shield featured the arms of a woman's natal kin, awarding primacy to her natal lineage. The left shield then featured the arms of her marital kin. When I applied this supposed formula to Scottish women's seals featuring the female figure, it began to break down quite quickly. The seal of Mary de Montemar, Countess of Fife, for instance, shown here, shows a reverse of the pattern promoted by historians of chivalric display. Her seal is particularly useful in disputing this proposed formula as she was the Countess of Fife, the premier earldom of Scotland, but also a member of the English nobility and a descendant of the King of England. So we might expect this proposed formula to appear in her seal as it has been argued to bear out in English women's material culture. Rather than a passive link between Scottish and English lineages, we see her as the literal embodiment of her royal um, lineage, dressed in robes here, bearing the arms of England, three lions passant. The right shield features the arms of Fife, awarding primacy to her marital kin, and the left shield bears the arms of Montemar, an eagle displayed. She was not a female heir, the only criteria that past scholarship has cited as exceptions to British sigillographic formulae for women. The example of the Countess of Fife seal suggests that these proposed patterns ought to be thoroughly tested. I use the formula against seals from my data set featuring the female figure. So this was a total of 22 seals. I found that when they were analyzed, 13 featured the marital arms in the dexter or right position, and nine featured arms in the sinister or left position. With regard to female heirs, the designs were evenly split with five featuring the marital arms in the dexter position and five featuring them in the sinister position. 
What emerges from this analysis is that there are no clear or formulaic patterns in the arrangement of coats of arms in women's seals in Scotland. This suggests that the seal designs of women were curated to suit their individual circumstances and relationships to noble lineage. These findings align with the arguments Elizabeth A. New and Philip R. Schofield have made, which have asserted individual choice as a key element in British sealing praxis. I will now trace the evolution of seal design and the proliferation of marshalling arms during the latter half of the 13th of the 14th century, excuse me, which moves us beyond what Beto's Rezac termed semantics of the female image. Bruce McAndrew's work on Scottish heraldry has shown that marshalling of arms in Scotland occurred in the 14th century. I would like to trace here the female contribution to the emergence of this practice. Marshalling is a practice of displaying more than one coat of arms on a shield in order to accommodate more than one lineage and or associated estates and titles. Early marshalling can be seen in impaled arms, which showed two lineages on a single shield. William Ray MacDonald observed in his 1904 seal catalog that the design of Isabella Randolph, which featured a shield bearing impaled arms and attached to a charter dated to 1351 or 1352, was the early, earliest instance of impaled arms being used in Scotland. The fact that the earliest example of impaled arms can be traced to a woman suggests that women were influencing innovations that accommodated their relationships to multiple kinship groups. This can be attested by the number of marshaled shields featured in the seal designs belonging to women in the present study. 32% of the seal design, 32% of the seal designs in this study feature marshaled arms, most often per palais to represent natal and marital lineages. We could maybe think of the impaling of arms creating a visual shorthand for the bridge that the female figure watched once represented in seal design. We can now turn to the evolution of marshalling arms that culminated in quarter, quartered shields, like the ones we saw in, like the one we saw in the seal of Mary Stuart, Countess of Angus, dating from 1459. Earlier armorial seals kept the shield, shields representing women's lineages and territorial claims separate. I have several examples here. Um, as you can see, I've got the seal of Eleanor Umfreville, Countess of Angus, which dates to the early 14th century. The seal design shows four shields meeting conjoined at their bases in the center of the seal. Each shield represents her lineage acquired by noble birth and marriage and expresses her personal identity as a representative of these lineages. We might further compare this design with other seal casts from the 14th century, including the seals shown here, belonging to Mary de Brecon, Margaret Fraser, and Mary Ramsey. The seal design of Agnes Randolph, Countess of March, can be read similarly to these seals and how they articulate her individual identity as a Scottish noble. Again, we see four shields arranged crosswise, coming to a point at the center of the seal. Reading from the top clockwise, we see a lion rampant within a double trezura, the Royal Arms of Scotland, three cushions within a double trezura, the Arms of Murray, and two shields featuring a lion rampant in a border charged with eight roses, which represented the arms of Dunbar and March. Interestingly, she treats Dunbar and March as distinct lineages when they were one and the same in terms of associated properties and title. The arrangement of these arms expressed her personal claims to power and authority as a Scottish elite. While the claims of Murray are perhaps exaggerated, as she asserts herself as Countess of Murray in the charter and the legend of her seal, she did not have possession of this earldom. It still con communicated her connection to Murray by birth as daughter of the Earl and member of the Randolph family. The design of her seal articulates her relationship to each lineage with the conjoined shields at their bases at the center, creating a visual focal point alluding to Agnes as this focal point between them. Further to this, the arms represented in the seal corresponded to the title she claimed in the charter to which this seal is attached. We might consider Agnes Randolph's seal and the others discussed as a precursor to later practice of quartering arms. 
We can compare the seal to the seal of Janet Dunbar, Countess of Murray, Lady of Fendroft and Crichton, which was in use in the 1450s. I have that here on the right. The arms are quartered and express her ties to each lineage designated in her charter. Dunbar, Murray, Fendroft and Crichton. When considered together, the seal designs of Agnes Randolph and Janet Dunbar demonstrate the evolution in heraldic convention taking place in late medieval Scotland and how women made use of and potentially influenced these emerging, emerging practices as they sought to represent their personal claims to multiple elite lineages acquired during the female life course. It's also worth mentioning here that elite Scottish women did not mention their life course stage in their seal legends, in that they don't list whether they're a daughter, wife, or widow. Um, they only list their titles. I would argue that this is because this is parsed efficiently enough by the inclusion of heraldic device, which would have been understood by their contemporaries and tied into the titles and relationships elaborated on in the text of the charter. The Three of Matrix gives us a unique glimpse of the making process and identity construction in late medieval Scottish sealing practice. The Matrix, found during the 1974 to 78 excavation of Threve Castle, a 14th century tower house belonging to the Black Douglas family, possibly depicts a design for Margaret Stewart, Duchess of Terrain, Countess of Douglas, Lady of Galloway and Annandale, who operated out of Thieve Threve during the 1420s as wife and then widow of the Earl of Douglas. There is a debate around what arms are represented in the Sir II position compared to the eventual seal design of the Duchess pictured here. Her later seal featured an impaled shield with the right side of the shield quartered. From right to left, it bears the four titles associated with the estate holdings of the Black Douglas family three fleur de lis reflecting the newly acquired Duchy of Terrain, a heart and chief three stars, the arms of Douglas, a psalter and chief, the arms of Annandale, and a lion rampant crowned, the arms of Galloway. On the left side of the shield, we see her royal lineage as Princess of Scotland represented with a lion rampant within a double trezura. This differs from the arms represented in the three of matrix, and I would like to particularly focus on the representation of the fleur de lis of terrain. In their 1981 article discussing the three finds, G.L. Good and C.G. Tabraham dated the matrix to around 1406 and suggested that the Sir II arms represented three mullets or stars communicating the Murray of Bothwell arms, which was the natal family of the Duchess's mother-in-law, Joanna Murray, Countess of Douglas and Lady of Bothwell. While the acquisition of territories associated with the Murray of Bothwell family was important to the Duchess's father-in-law through his man marriage to Joanna Murray, Bruce McAndrews' research has shown that the Murray of Bothwell arms did not feature in subsequent seals of Douglas Earls, including the, du the Duchess's husband, the fourth Earl Archibald. This casts doubt on Good and Tabraham's argument that the arms are represented here in the matrix. Given the size and condition of the three of matrix, there is still room for interpretation about what the arms are actually depicting in the Sir II shield. I would propose that the matrix dates instead from 1424 or later, and the arms represented in the Sir II shield are actually three fleur de lis, which would represent the Duchy of Terrain. Visually, I think that the device resembles the Florida Lee more than three stars seen on the previous slide. While it's difficult to read in its present condition, it is relatively easy to see that the device lacks the five pointed star that feature in the Murray of Bothwell arms. Further to this, the Duchess does not mention Bothwell in her charters or in the seal legend of her eventual seal. The Duchy of Terrain was a significant acquisition for the Douglas family in 1424, when the Duchess's husband was granted the Duchy for his service to the King of France in the Hundred Years' War. Katie Stevenson has drawn attention to the importance and significance of the acquisition of Terrain, particularly in Scotland, as no other foreign noble had received a ducal rank from a late medieval French king. 
Given the fact that Margaret Stewart made, you, made use of the ducal title in her charters and eventual seal, I would suggest that the matrix may be a prototype and part of the design process as the Duchess adapted the terrain heraldry into her seal design. The three matrix gives us further insight into the construction of identity through seals and the ways in which women participated in this process to express their personal ties to the prestige and privileges afforded by noble lineage. At the start of this paper, I pose two research questions that would guide my discussion. First, how do women's seals show the evolution in heraldic convention and sealing practice in 14th and 15th century Scotland? With regard to sealing practice, there was a shift in the 14th century in preferred seal shape from ovoid to round. We might link this shift in shape to evolution of heraldic convention as the symbology of heraldry offered a concise way to express complex relationships to multiple elite lineages with the emergence of marshalling arms in Scotland in the mid 14th century. These findings also corroborate Helen Geek's argument made last week here that shape of seal ought not to be considered a marker of femininity as it has been in past scholarship. The second question I posed was whether or not women's use of heraldry in their seals was formulaic. I have hopefully demonstrated that this was not the case, at least in late medieval Scotland, and that the arrangement of the arms within a seal design communicated an individual's personal claims to elite lineage and associated privileges and resources. As such, the heraldry deployed in seals offers us a rich vein of further research into the ontological meaning of women's seals beyond what Beto's Rezac termed the semantics of the female Im image. Far from formulaic, women's use of heraldry in their seals communicated their, the accumulated links to lineage that was unique to the female life course and further influenced sealing praxis in late medieval Scotland. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, Rachel. That that was uh, ex excellent sort of sur survey of the of the whole subject, and um, uh, thank you very much for for it. Um, now um, it was fourteen thirty four. We've got um, yes, uh, a few minutes for questions. Beautifully timed. Thank you. Um, one from oh. Can I start by asking what the material of the three matrix is? It's it, lead. It, it's lead. Yes. Ah, oh, right, right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very, very interesting. Um, it's also, it's also quite small. Um, quite small. It's quite small, and the um, I didn't have time to talk about it here, but the legend is also very um, succinct. It just says. Sig Margaret Douglas, and that's it. Um, but without her titles. Without yes. her titles, which it also makes me think it was a, a prototype figuring out how to incorporate a, the new title into her, into her seal design rather than actually in use. And, and presumably the, the, um, the seal, it, was lost in her, in her castle or in the grounds of her castle. Three. Yes, yes, yeah, it was. She actually yeah. owned it. So it looks as if it might have been a, a trial piece, you know, for, <laughs> exactly. for a later thing, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very interesting. Anyway, I mustn't hold questions. Um, Alex Maxwell Finlater has said, the seal of Isabella Countess of Fife does not seem to have a Stuart Fess. Um, the the first one. Yeah, the very first one, right at the beginning. Um, uh, that seems to be a statement rather than a question, anyway. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. I'll I'll uh, go back and look at it. Right. Um, Elizabeth Ewan says, "Are there any differences between the use of heraldry between women of Scottish uh, and English birth?" Um, I, uh, is there a difference in the use of heraldry if you were born of an aristocratic family in England and married in a Scots right. Scotland? 
Um, I think that's an excellent question. It's one I've not, I've not probably thought about as fully as I could, um, mostly because the seals that I look at kind of as we go forward in time tend to be uh, belonging to Scottish women that are born in Scotland um, as well. So I think that's a really interesting question to think about um, for the earlier seals belonging to um, Eleanor of Umfreville and uh, Mary de Montemer and how maybe their, their English their Englishness as well as their, their kind of Scottishness by marriage might be influencing design there. Right, um, then uh, that's good, yes. Then there's a, a comment really from Katie Hawkes um, about formulas and formulaic, um, a, lo a long question I won't read out, but seems to um, uh, uh, say, say the formula of frameworks, the individuals play with formula and, and in themselves establish new, new formulae at the same time. Um, yes. Which is really sort of expanding on your interpretation of the individuality of yes. the decisions being made. I think, I think the most important thing to take away from the, the evidence is that there's, cho there's a lot of choice involved in how to represent themselves in seal design. Um, and that kind of trying to break it down into kind of easy to understand patterns doesn't really work because each person's individual circumstances are going to influence the way in which they're representing themselves. Um, in their seals. Okay, right. There are one or two other detailed um, heraldic comments that uh, you and the others can note and perhaps um, I think really uh, respond to uh, perhaps in individually or, or again. 